welcome everyone. My name is Jess Smith and you are at the um, next iteration of our Works in Action webinars, Caring for Creation. Um, I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement and dedication. I think Earth Day is a particularly uh, powerful and appropriate, meaningful time to consider the land that you're on, to give our thanks, our respect, our reverence to those who've cared for it over its history, and to listen and learn from um, people who continue to speak up and take action to protect it. Um, I acknowledge that the land that constitutes the city of Mississauga, where I live and work, um, is part of Treaty 14 and the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the huron wendat peoples, and the Wyandotte Nations. Um, these people, these communities, they've long stewarded the earth in a way that is unrelated to colonial concepts of land ownership. Um, so in the spirit of gratitude and reconciliation and care for creation, I invite you to learn about the cultural relationship of Indigenous peoples in your area with the land. Um, for Mississauga, where I am, um, that could mean understanding the importance of water historically, um, to give context and insight to the reconciliation journey of Indigenous peoples and settlers here. Because uh, reconciliation is our collective community responsibility. You're welcome to add a land acknowledgement of your own into the chat, and I encourage you to hold it in your hearts and your minds uh, during our conversation today. Again, my name is Jess Smith. I'm the Foundation Communications and Campaign Associate. Um, I'm also a monthly donor to the Foundation's Environmental Fund, so um, I guess I'm particularly excited to be your host for this today. Um, a quick introduction to our granting program. The Foundation offer a wide variety of granting opportunities for organizations and individuals bringing life to the mission and values of the United Church of Canada. Um, in 2022, the Foundation identified climate justice as one of our core priorities, and it continues to shape the ideals and work of our organization. And we are proud to support innovative opportunities from communities of faith to live with respect in creation. Our panel today our grant recipients whose projects um, and hard work exemplifies our commitment to climate justice and care of creation. So our panel today includes Wendy Pope from Denman Island United Church and Gathering Place in Denman Island, BC. Wendy is a settler of Highland Scots heritage um, and lives in Denman Island on the unceded territory of the Comox First Nation. She spent 35 years in the activist reclaiming collective of earth witches and in recent years has been delving into the ancient Greek Hermetic and Hebrew Kabbalistic traditions, which are foundational to most Western spirituality. Um, in the earth realm, she practices permaculture and raises bantam chickens. Um, we also have Patty Duquette from Eden United Church in Mississauga. Patty's family, her husband and two daughters have been attending Eden United Church for 30 years. She has always been interested in environmental issues, and she's been involved in many of Eden's groups and committees over the years. She currently serves as a member of the Mission Outreach Hub and holds the position of chair for the Peace Garden Project, which she will speak to today. And finally, we have Jessica Banner from Evergreen Canada. Jessica is a development officer and writer at Evergreen, and she holds a PhD from the University of Ottawa and she is passionate about creating better public spaces for people and the planet. So welcome to all of you. And now that I've already introduced you all, I'm going to invite you to do it yourselves as well. But um, if you could also briefly provide a quick um, elevator pitch to summarize the project that you're gonna talk about today. Sure, I can go first. <laughs> good, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica and I'm a development officer. Uh, and grant writer at Evergreen. So I have the privilege today to talk to you about our um, drum feast program at Evergreen. So in response to community requests for more frequent uh, ceremonies for indigenous groups that use Evergreen Brickworks, uh, we partnered with Wandering Spirit School to host four drum feasts at the Brickworks. Um, this collaborative project has brought together a bunch of indigenous community members for ceremonies and celebrations on site at Evergreen Brickworks. 
Uh, the program combines education, healthy eating, and cultural ceremony. So at each drum feast, we typically have about 150 individuals from the Wandering Spirit School community attend the ceremony. We have fire keepers from the school uh, that share traditions and practices. And following the feast, we have grade-specific nature-based activities like loose parts play, ecological learning, and nature hikes facilitated by Evergreen. The goal of our project has been to increase access to ecologically unique spaces for approximately 600 urban indigenous community members every year. And we just hosted our spring drum feast last week. So I'm excited to talk about that with you guys today. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Patty from Eden United Church and I'm representing the mission and outreach small group ministry. The idea of the Peace Garden came from a brainstorming session back in December 2018. Um, I wasn't actually on the committee at that time, but the, the idea kind of was on the back burner until the fall of 2021. And as we were in the midst of the pandemic, we were looking for new ways that we could connect with our local community. And the idea of the Peace Garden was revisited. And we decided to take a look at what would be involved in, in planting a peace garden. Um, a couple members of our congregation or of our emo group had been to peace gardens at other United churches and had seen what they had done. And some of those uh, properties also had peace poles. And that was something that became a very strong focus for our garden. We created a subcommittee for the peace garden and began to investigate how we would go about doing that. Uh, we were fortunate to connect with Credit Valley Conservation Authority and their Greening Corporate Grounds Program. And they came and did an environmental assessment of our whole property, not just the area where the Peace Garden was going to be, but the whole three acres. And uh, that was quite exciting to get their feedback. We had an old raised garden bed on the corner of the property in a very highly trafficked area of foot traffic and on the corner. And so it was in bad need of a, of a makeover. And so that's where we decided to concentrate our efforts and to put our in our peace garden. Oh, hi all. I'm, I'm just very grateful for this opportunity to share with you and to hear about the work that other people are doing. Um, uh, my name's Wendy Pope. I share a very small island community with about 1,300 human souls, as well as a lot of other life forms. We share a high proportion of spiritual diversity here on Denman Island and an active concern and even despair for the well being of the earth and all of her inhabitants. Uh, teammate Helen Wilson and I felt that the church and community would both benefit from sharing an in-depth experiential exploration of that the framework of relating to the elements of nature of earth air fire water and uh, when they combine they form the fifth which is the sacred thing the quintessence spirit the elements framework is both ancient and contemporary and we felt would be uh, really accessible. We knew from experience that the, a framework for direct relationship with the aspects of nature um, could help to move us collectively in a positive direction. The direction of right relationship, I, thou, rather than me, it, a loving, respectful, um, relating. Uh, my experience with the Reclaiming Collective of 34 years or so really uh, laid the groundwork for, for this as being a life-changing experience. Um, we approached the Seeds of Hope about supporting our project with complete transparency about the pagan roots of the teachings, and we were met with a very enthusiastic response that was really like heart lifting. Inspired by our experience with reclaiming, we were fortunate we had two deeply wise and experienced facilitators available to come and teach um, and lead our weekend long um, event. 
and uh, 25 of us inhabited our sanctuary, our sacred space for the entire weekend. And it rocked. Thanks, Wendy. Um, okay, so if I could get each of you to tell us a little bit more about what inspired your projects, how the ideas were conceptualized, what needs um, in your respective communities you were aiming to address with these projects. We'll just keep going in the same order. Sounds good. Um, so this project is sort of the culmination of a number of years of work and uh, collaboration with a bunch of our Indigenous partners at Evergreen. Um, the big catalyst for this project is that Evergreen, or not Evergreen, Toronto is home to one of the largest urban Indigenous communities in Canada with more than 70,000 Indigenous individuals living in the city. In this highly urbanized context, there is such particular need for space close to land, or space and land close to connected waterways. And we are very lucky at Evergreen to be situated in the Don River Valley uh, ravine system and to have this really unique space that is also on the TTC line, the subway. Um, and that was really the inspiration for the project is that we had a lot of our indigenous partners and educators telling us that Young people were disconnected from nature, were disconnected from their communities. There was a huge gap between youth and elders, uh, and they really were in need of space, uh, space and support to have these ceremonies. And we were very fortunate at Evergreen to have a number of Indigenous staff and facilitators uh, who were really keen to step up and develop not only the Drum Feast program, which has been supported by the United Church Foundation, but... Um, sort of a host of other little runoff programs that have been inspired over the success of this year that I'm really excited about uh, and have, I think, generated a lot of community growth. So the project sort of was inspired by a real need and has flourished into this really vibrant community that we are really, really grateful to support um, at the Brickworks. Okay, so we were inspired by the need to connect more with the local community. Um, there's a lot of foot traffic in our area, but not a lot of people using the property for any particular purpose. And we were inspired by what we had seen at other churches and also the desire to clean up this old garden bed that wasn't doing anything. Um, and we hoped to create an inviting space that would encourage people to stop by and sit in the garden and relax and take a moment to out of their hustle and bustle of their life to, to reflect and breathe and just relax a little bit. And we also felt it was very important to um, contribute to the rehabilitating the area for local habitat and wildlife. And so that kind of focused us on to, to using native and pollinator plants. Um, we wanted to, and we're still aiming to grow our connections with the local community, which includes a seniors building right next door, a high school and a middle school nearby, as well as we host um, a food bank and a daycare in our on our property as well. And to create a much needed food source and energy for pollinators, um, and that was a huge motivation for us to lean towards planting the, we originally were gonna put in about 700 pollinator plants. Um, it ended up being 300, which we were thankful that we didn't tackle 700 plants because the 300 <laughs> ended up being plenty enough for us. Um, but those were kind of the things that inspired us to, to move forward and, and green our property a little bit. Me next. Yep. Huh. I think what inspired us to uh, take on this project, which I have to say ended up being a, a chunk of work, um, 
was and still is our desire to have the United Church of Denman Island be a, a spiritually diverse um, sacred space where more than just Christianity happens, our Christian population on Denman is really tiny. And if we depended on just that to keep our church alive, it wouldn't happen. Um, and our, our community is really diverse. We have so many different ways of honoring spirit here. And we really felt that this place could be so much more and that it could also undo some of the negative trappings and feelings that encumber Christianity and Christian churches. There are many people who still don't feel comfortable crossing the threshold into this building strictly because of what it represents and the history. And we very much want to move thoughtfully and with intention in a more accessible direction, as well as the desperate need that we have to get uh, some kind of way of people feeling less powerless in the face of environmental crisis. Um, those two things really came together in wanting to host this event, this weekend training. Um, direct relationship with nature and direct relationship with our community seem to just really go hand in hand. And um, that was, I think, largely the motivation to uh, take a step and reach out and do it. That's so interesting, the commonalities between the all of your projects um, and, and, you know, listening to the diverse needs of your communities and, and uh, using um, environmental projects to to bring that kind of that the diverse community together, even though all your projects are quite different. Um, and I, I can I, I attended the um, the uh, dedication day of the Eden um, Peace Garden, and I can attest to the fact that pollinators were deeply attracted to it immediately <laughs> on that day in particular anyway. Um, uh, okay, so the the new creed uh, clearly names um, care for creation um, as an important tenet. So if you could speak a little bit about um, how your projects respond to the new creed's call to, to care for creation and, and why you think it's crucial to prioritize um, climate justice and environmental projects given the challenges we face in today's world, um, you know, environmental climate despair um, and, and all of the things that are um, challenging us in our modern world. Yeah, it's a great question. Um... I think sort of the driving force behind um, Evergreen's project sort of more holistically speaking in this project specifically is that we're seeing sort of off the charts and unprecedented levels of youth environmental anxiety. Um, children, like teachers are telling us, parents are telling us, our community members are telling us that like kids are not only more disconnected from nature than they ever have been before, but they are anxious about the future. Um, and so that is why the projects that we are running and this project in particular is so important is because we're able with the support of foundations like the United Church Foundation, we're able to get kids who live in highly urbanized environments around the Brickworks. Uh, the Brickworks is sort of bordered on, on all sides by three of the most, or on three of its sides by the most urbanized and underserved communities in Toronto. Mm -hmm. majority of people are living in high-rise um, apartment buildings with pretty much no contact, like no, no green spaces. Um, and so 
this program is really made possible um, sort of reconnecting not only youth through ceremonies but all, and through the environmental programming that comes with it and connecting them to nature, but also connecting parents and teachers and um, elders um, with the environment while sort of foregrounding indigenous knowledge and indigenous land practices for those communities by those communities. So we're, we are super privileged to be able to support these programs. And I think the, the reconnecting children and their communities to nature is one of the most important steps towards building a better future because we are very lucky to be supporting the future environmental stewards. And I think we need them. We need them so badly. So yeah, thank you. Well, we were really excited to share what we were learning about the importance of pollinators and native plants with our wider community. And we organized an eco day because we had made connections with Credit Valley Conservation Authority and Blooming Boulevards, which is a sort of grassroots Mississauga um, organization that encourages people to plant pollinator gardens on their boulevards. And they, they help them get the city permits, they provide the plants and educate people on the importance of, of those types of gardens. Um, so, when we put in our 300 plants, um, our, our main focus was to try and get lots more pollinators. And like Jess said, there were lots on that day. Um, we also put in um, plants for the four directions, the cedar. Well, I didn't put in the tobacco because I couldn't find it, but I'll work on that this year. But we put in the plants for the four directions. And in June, when we started planting, there was no bees, there were no butterflies, there was no insects, there was nothing. We, we did a pollinator count and we had like 10 flies or something, it was ridiculous. But by September, it was crazy. It was just a hub of activity and it just made us realize that creating these pockets of, um, pathways for the pollinators to to use is important for them to move around and we felt that was important for contributing to the the local ecology in our area and prior to the eco day we did a little skit to communicate that idea with the congregation saying that you know if the if the bee has to go too far to get his food then he's too tired to get back to his hive and feed his colony. So that was part of what we were trying to educate people on the importance of the pollinator gardens. And because we had made this connection with Credit Valley Conservation Authority, they have come back and approached us last fall and we are now installing a mini forest on our property as well. And so that's a really cool thing that's going to happen this year. And that is all because of the first project of the Peace Garden and the connections that we had made in the community. Wow. A butterfly effect. Yes. <laughs> that's so inspiring. I, I... I want to visit that garden and celebrate your pollinators and your bees. Um, so the, the new creed, when I read it, I, I, I kind of went, wow, okay. That's cool. That's progress within the Christian faith. Um, I think I come from, because because my tradition is activist and um, I just, I would like to share with you something that functions as our creed. Um, and I, and I read this with the greatest respect for brother Jesus um, and all of his teachings. So it's, there's no dismissal and no 
no disrespect intended. <clears throat> the declaration of the four sacred things. The earth is a living conscious being in company with cultures of many different times and places. We name these things as sacred, air, fire, water, and earth. When we see them as breath, energy, blood, and body of the mother, or as the blessed gifts of a creator, or as symbols of interconnected systems that sustain life, we know that nothing can live without them. To call these things sacred is to say that they have a value beyond their usefulness for human ends, that they themselves become the standards by which our acts, our economics, our laws, and our purposes must be judged. No one has the right to appropriate them or profit from them at the expense of others. Any government that fails to protect them forfeits its legitimacy. All people, all living things are part of the earth life and so are sacred. No one of us stands higher or lower than any other. Only justice can assure balance. Only ecological balance can sustain freedom. Only in freedom can that fifth sacred thing we call spirit flourish in its full diversity. To honor the sacred is to create conditions in which nourishment, sustenance, habitat, knowledge, freedom, and beauty can thrive. To the honor of the sacred is to make love possible. To this, we dedicate our curiosity, our will, our courage, our silences, and our voices. To this, we dedicate our lives. This was written by Star. Thanks, Wendy, for that. So you've all touched on it a little bit, um, but if you could uh, expand a little bit on what the impact is that you've witnessed in your community um, since doing, since starting these projects, um, what are the outcomes you've seen so far, how the community just uh, responded to your project, the feedback you received about it, what the next steps are? Definitely. Um, I want to start by just reading from uh, some of the feedback we got from one of the teachers from Wandering Spirit School. Um, so this is about one of our recent drum feasts. So the evergreen kitchen was filled with laughter and the sound of the big drum echoed through the valley. The power of food and community was reflected in the many hands that created the meal of smoked moose stew, sweet water bannock and strawberry drink. Feeding the community and feasting with the drums while surrounded by nature allows our relations to be part of a celebration in a good way. So the, the, the feedback from our community has been um, really wonderful. We have been very lucky to have very good um, attendance at um, our last Drum Feast event. I think we had a record high number of participants uh, from the community. And one of the main takeaways that we've had um, is that the teachers are really enjoying uh, the facilitation with their students, particularly around risky play. Um, so we have a loose parts um, set up in our children's garden at Evergreen Brickworks where children are encouraged to take risks and build things and use um, sort of found objects in the natural landscape to engage in, in creative and risky play that they might not otherwise have access to. Um, so we are seeing them really engaging with the seasons around them and the environment that we have in a way that has been really helpful. Some of the other feedback we've received is that um, teachers are noticing behavioral problems in their classes are diminishing. They, there's been a direct correlation in the amount of outside time and the repeat visits for this community group and a decrease in uh, sort of negative child, childhood behavior, so bullying, um, and disrespect to peers. And uh, we're, yeah, we're just seeing, we'll have sort of our quantitative and qualitative metrics in the next couple of weeks after we have our last drum feast. 
uh, in late May, but we're seeing some really positive and exciting impacts in the community. And um, I'm really excited to see what happens in the next school year, because this is really, I think, had meaningful impact for both students, teachers, and other members of the community. And we're excited to see where it goes in, in the next school year. Well, one of our main um, focuses was for the for people to come and sit and enjoy the property. And that has definitely started to happen. There's a senior's residence right next door that we actually share a parking lot with. And they've come over and they sit on the bench and they watch the garden. And I had one, one resident say to me that, oh, we've been watching our flowers grow. And so that was just so nice that she would sit and, and watch the flowers. And, and they ha people have to walk past the garden to get across the street to the shopping center. So there's a lot of foot traffic and people are start stopping to enjoy the, the garden. One day, a couple of us were on one side of the garden, crouched down, transplanting some plants. And when we stood up, there was this lady sitting on the bench. And so I went over and I asked her, oh, do you live in the seniors building? No, I was just walking by and decided to sit and she was sitting there crocheting. So I was just, that really made my day that day. That was, that was awesome. And on the day of our dedication ceremony, it also fell on truth and reconciliation day. So we had um, our regular church service and then we went out into the garden to bless the garden and lots of people were wearing their orange shirts. And uh, the following day, one of our congregants got a call from a neighbor who was of indigenous descent to say how moved he was because he just happened to be driving by and saw all these people outside with their orange, <clears throat> their orange shirts on. And that he was just thrilled to see that. And he made the effort to call and, and communicate that with the church. Um, also, during our uh, clothing mart, which we run every fall, uh, several of the volunteers go outside, use that area to take their lunch breaks, sit on the bench. Students from the nearby schools are stopping by um, daily. They, they have to walk past the garden. Um, the food bank runs out of the, the church, and it's actually the entrance to the food bank is on the same side of the property as the garden. So those clients are seeing the garden. And the, we've even had a member of our congregation um, inspired to do a painting of our garden. And she presented that to us last Sunday at church. And so we're going to get that installed inside. And so, yeah, the ripple effect has been wonderful. And like I said, with the, the mini, gar mini forest being put in, we've been approached by the scouts. Uh, the local scouting group, they want to help plant the trees. So we've seen a lot of ripple effect. Um, we were in touch with the environmental club from the high school next door. I haven't had much response from them, but I am going to try and reach out to them again and see um, and encourage them to come and look at the garden when it's in bloom and and use it as a teaching tool for, for kids in the environmental group. So um, yeah, we're really happy with the way things have been going. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the effects on in in my community, right? Um, hmm. During the weekend that we were all together. Um, we rearranged the sanctuary into a circle, all of the pews against the wall, and um, it was quite a transformative um, process. So we were creating sacred space throughout the weekend, and um, and then creating a ritual appropriate to the element to that we were focusing on for that morning or that afternoon for each session. When we started the weekend, one of the participants came in with a lot of anger, like 
huge anger around housing issue and the fact that in that person's view, um, our community wasn't doing nearly enough. And it was, uh, it was quite a disruptive energy. And our facilitators gently contained that and didn't allow that the that that was going to uh, become the focus of our time together um and the, the circle kind of held and and it, it didn't fall apart at that point but it came up multiple times during the weekend this one disruptive member who was obviously suffering a lot of pain around this issue but what we witnessed as we were together in community and drawing on the resources of what we're made up of and what our world is made up of and focusing on that in a regenerative way, this person's anger started to settle. And it came down in in invisible in increments over, over the time. And more people found that person approachable and there was conversations. And some of the conversations were a little testy because we were sharing meals together. But there was also a feeling that something quite profound was happening in that there wasn't a us and them energy. There was a we we're in community here together, and this is sacred space. This is special. And we really watched something quite transformative happen that I don't think could have happened at a meeting or um, an event. It, it needed some, it needed a container that was made to hold energy and to move energy. And at the end, by the end of the weekend, that person was giving and receiving hugs from other other participants, and even apologizing for their disruptive behavior. Um, and so that, to me, epitomized what can happen when community comes together, not about themselves, but about something larger. And we were here about what surround us, what surrounds us, what we're made up of, how to have a better relationship with it. And so our relationships improved as a result. Uh, since then, multiple people in the community, because there was 25 of us here, multiple people in the community have approached us, Helen and I, to to thank us and to tell us what a meaningful experience that was and that he really hoped we would do more. And we're like, whoa, we'll support you if you organize it, it was big, but very much a positive resonance that just keeps on moving forward. So we're, um, there was a, a feeling that it was visible, it was witnessable, the, the shift and what we, hope now is that we'll see the ripples of that move out into people's actions and relationship with the community and i i just think it it gave positive energy to people who are doing that work and feeling like oh it's too hard but actually we're all doing it together um everybody that was there had some special interest in in environment but we weren't there about their special interest. We were there about the whole picture. Uh, and I think that that, I think that's our way forward. Thank you, Wendy. That that kind of speaks to what I was going to ask next. So um, maybe I'll, I was going to ask about how support from the foundation helped you all grow with your communities. But I think in answering that last question, you, um, I'll answer that. It's very um, connected. Um, and and all, as I said, all of your projects are so different, but you're all kind of speaking to the same things in, in different ways through a different lens. That's very cool. But maybe um, what you can uh, um, tell us a little bit about, um, our, our Seeds of Hope grant round for this spring just closed earlier this week. As many of you here probably know, 
Um, but uh, we're curious if you could describe uh, what the process of coming to the decision about applying for a grant with the foundation was like, um, how how um, our granting program aligned with the values and goals of your projects, uh, Jessica, particularly because you're a non-United Church organization. There may be some folks here who, who are um, interested in how that connected um, with your organization. I think I just want to pick up a thread before I, I answer your question just from Wendy. I I really resonate with you know what you're talking about, and we have been as an organization really consciously rethinking how we interact with the communities we serve, and we speak a lot about moving at the speed of trust mm -hmm. as sort of the the thread that underpins uh, community outreach and community conversations. And like I was really struck by how similar all of our projects are, even though they are really quite diverse. Um, so why, why the United Church Foundation? Um, I started working at Evergreen two years ago, and one of the first prospect calls I ever did was with the United Church Foundation with Eric. Uh, and I was just, I had reached out as sort of my first ever foundation that I was looking to interact with, and I had no idea what to expect. And I was so overwhelmed by the warmth and the interest and the passion um, that this this group of uh, individuals who run the foundation uh, are really driven by. And I think that we align a lot um, over and over the past years, it's really been evident that this prioritization of the environment and in supporting sustainable, and transformative community projects that are centered in in nature and in in facilitating communities in nature has really been a shared priority. Um, and I just think I feel very, very lucky to get to work with and deliver projects in collaboration with this group. Um, it was it was uh, not something I had. Uh, you know, they were not, you guys were, are, were a new sort of foundation working with us. And it's been one of the most fulfilling relationships um, just because it's so clear that I think the mission is so focused on um, community impact. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. So that's, I think the overlap was pretty profound. It was um, it was a member of our congregation who actually came to us and said, "Did you know about the seeds of hope?" And and we didn't. We'd been given a list of potential um, organizations we could get grants from, and none of us had written a grant, so it was rather nerve wracking. And the fact that the seeds of hope was a United Church of Canada uh, foundation grant, and we were United Church. The connection made me feel very comfortable. And when I spoke with Eric and got a, a sense of what was involved, read through the parameters and found that our idea for a pollinator peace garden fit in nicely with the parameters of their um, environmental focus. We didn't look anywhere else that we said, oh, that's it. We're just going to write this grant. And we're not going to look at any other grants because we felt that it fit perfectly with what we wanted to do. Uh, we also felt that the, the webinars that were done leading up to having to write the grant, again, having no experience writing a grant ever, um, that was very helpful because we didn't know what we were doing basically. <laughs> and so that they were so helpful in answering questions and calls and emails that it really helped make the process quite smooth. And we couldn't be more thankful for the support that we received from them. Uh, our garden grew and flourished beyond our wildest expectations in the first year. And I know 100% I'm convinced that the remarkable growth would not have happened without our Seeds of Hope grant. Um, our grant money was put towards the irrigation system. And without that irrigation system in place, the garden would not have flourished the way it did. I mean, we put the irrigation in, we did the proper site preparation, and we were hopeful that the garden would grow. 
Our research had said that in the first year, the plants concentrate their energy on the roots growing down into the ground and that we wouldn't see a lot of above ground flourishing until the second and third year. But we had a fully bloomed, amazing garden in one year and that was 100% because of the irrigation system that was funded by the Seeds of Hope. And I should also mention that we did install a peace poll that says, may peace prevail on earth in eight different, eight or six, I can't remember, languages. And we also put in a dedication sign honoring the church, our churches, our congregation's 200th anniversary. And that's why we put in 300 plants. We put in 200 plants to honor our past and 100 plants to imagine our future. And those two elements, the peace poll and the dedication sign, were also funded through the United Church of Canada, but through the Justice and Reconciliation Grant. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned that so that people knew that there was more than one avenue for funding through the United Church. And because of the success of what I'm now calling PG-1, we're now working on Peace Garden 2, and we just yesterday went to Humber College and had presentations made by their landscaping students on what vision they would have for our property. Um, and we were blown away by the, the scope of their intent and how they used their designs to reflect the cross that's on the building into the gardens. And it was just amazing. And so, None of that would have been possible without the Seeds of Hope grant. Yeah, I, echoing uh, a bunch of what was said, and I just also want to um, congratulate the, the pollinator garden. Um, I'm so excited that people are caring for the little bugs and the bees. Um, yeah, we found out about it uh, in a kind of funny way. It, was uh, an email was sent to us via our our uh, pastoral charge supervisor, but there was kind of an understanding that it was only about youth, and we went, oh, how can we spin this? And oh, this doesn't feel like us. And then reading down the whole list, we went, oh, actually, there's more here. So we investigated. We um, put our original idea to Jenna, who gave us really wonderful feedback and, and enthusiasm like yeah we need to do more of this so we went for it we found the grant writing process generative and profound it made us we had to work at the questions made us delve into what was our intention what was authentic what could we really stand on what was our ground that we were coming from and Helen and I spent hours working back and forth with each question, um, getting to a point where we said, yes, that's it. That's our truth. We can say that. We can stand behind that. And, um, and, and we felt supported in, in that truthfulness that we didn't have to make it work. We could be true. We could be real. The fact that we had the, the, that we were, allowed to ask for funding for to feed our participants enriched the experience so much because people weren't dispersing at meal times they were gathering and the energy of that was beautiful people chatting over lunch and making plans and getting to know one another so that we built community because of that we also had because of the funding the opportunity to to have a, a quite deep sliding scale um, for participation in in the event and and that made it accessible to people that couldn't have come otherwise and we still came out solid financially it was um, it was just altogether a good experience it was hard work um, as as Patty I think was saying the the webinar where we got taken through the steps of of working through the um, application process was hugely valuable because we didn't we got we got to find out yeah we're kind of we're 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 making this work we're on we're on track and where we weren't it brought us back on track so that was super helpful we were really grateful for that kind of support 
So altogether, very positive. We were really grateful. We continue to tell people, wow, you know, like, yeah, we had this amazing experience through the United Church, which we get to say is it's real and it's and it's concrete and it's something that people can hear and say, oh, wow, I didn't know the United Church did that. Well, yeah, they they do. You do. And and uh, and that's part of shifting from where we've been to where we want to go. That's it. Thank you, all of you. That, those were wonderful testimonies to working with us, and, and I hope that other folks would agree with, uh, <laughs> with you on that. Um, so we're going to um, move to our Q&A. Did have one of them come in um, asking if our panel is familiar with Dr. Sylvia Kiesmat. She's a theologian and a farmer who lives in the Kawartha region of Ontario. She's published several books on care for the environment and causes of climate disasters. If any of you want to speak to, if you are aware of that um, author. I haven't heard of her, but I would love for you to write that down somewhere so that I can look it up. <laughs> Well, we will we'll put that in our resources in our email um, post webinar. Um, if if any of you have any resources as well that you'd like to share with the group, um, we will put them in the webinar uh, email as well with the recording. There is a question in the in the chat, Patty, about if you if there are any difficulties with any waste and and um, hazardous products being left in the garden area. Um, I, I guess the question is referring to garbage and debris by the people that walk by. Yeah, there's a little bit of, I pulled some plastic bags out of there the other day. Um, but I think that's just regular trash that kind of gets blown around because we're on a major intersection. Um, there's a bus stop right there. So nothing concerning in any way we did have the bench flipped over um not long after we put it out but it was after school had come back in we we put the bench in there in july and then in september someone flipped it over so we put ground anchors on the bench so it won't get flipped over again but we've had no major concerns of vandalism or garbage or anything like that not yet anyway Fingers crossed. Um, if if any of you would like to um, drop a piece of advice to anyone who's looking to initiate a, a project similar to yours, a, a quick sound bite. Hmm. I would say that if you have a conservation authority in your area that works with the watershed that you're in and that kind of thing. Credit Valley Conservation Authority is hugely beneficial to have that connection. And because of that, we get emails and things about workshops they're doing on how to get rid of invasive species and all kinds of different um, projects that come because of that. But the cr conservation authorities are a, a wonderful resource. Yeah, I think my one, one piece of advice would be ask questions, like ask your community what they need. I think that has really been the cornerstone of our success with this project. Um, ask questions of both your community and people who are doing similar things in your area. So it's really great to hear about Conservation Authority outside of Toronto. We work with primarily Toronto-based conservationists, but it's, it's, ask people who are involved in this work already because usually they'll they'll have some information to point you in the right direction um i would say be brave um uh i i would have i would have not thought we would get support for what we did um so ask, yeah, be, reach out, be brave, um, and have a good buddy to do it with. I, we, Helen Wilson and I worked 
solidly as a team. Um, it, 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 it really helped having another person to draft, to think through, to, 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 de to define that intention and clarity about what you're doing. Um, and to, to just get the work done and to feel like it's not, you know, it's not an, a too big task. So I was really grateful to my, to my solid buddy. We got it done, but we only got it done because we did it together. Thank you, all of you. That's really great advice. Um, so we've we've reached the end of our time together today. I want to thank our panel, Patty, Wendy, Jessica. Thank you all for your time and for sharing uh, with us about your projects. Uh, we're grateful for our relationships with you, all of you. Um, I want to say that this webinar um, has been listed on the uh, Together for the Love of Creation um, events page. I'm going to pop the link right there, and it'll also be in the, um, the post-webinar email. Um, that's a list of Earth Week events that are happening across Canada, uh, virtually and in person, um, for uh, through the For the Love of Creation ecumenical group. Um, Check that out, find one in your area or um, add your own. Um, and uh, I hope you all have a great um, Earth Week, Earth Month, Earth Day. And thanks for coming out today, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.